Welcome to the Skeptic's Guide to Investing with Steve Davenport and Clem Miller. Every two weeks, Steve and Clem bring you brief investment insights you may not find anywhere else. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Here are Steve and Clem. Right, exactly. Welcome, everybody, to Skeptic's Guide to Investing. I'm Clem Miller, and today we are going to talk about personal finance, money management ideas, top five, how to start adulting. Steve Davenport and I will dig into the steps you need to take when starting out to get your assets working as hard as you do. When I think of money management, I find it hard to pick where you start. Steve, have you been focused on, you've been focused, I should say, on financial wellness most of your career. Where do you think investing and money management, personal finance should start for people? There are a lot of lists out there, Clem, and I want to be clear about starting wherever you are and with whatever you can do. If it's 50 or or $100 a month, that's where you start. There are no bad plans, but plans could be made with a higher chance of success. So, Steve, you, you've done some work with this and, you know, over time, what did your group come up with for personal finance top five? Um, these are ideas were come up, were created to look at your life and your finances and align them together for your best, uh, your best life. I think that people need to plan the way they want their life to be. Let's just get started and doing some of this is a great way to begin. It's a long journey and every journey starts with a step. So really, we looked at two main areas of financial literacy, personal finance and money management. We tackled personal finance a few weeks ago, but today we'll start the money management podcast. We want to be brief so that people start and don't feel overwhelmed. I believe we're in a time of great change where investments have become more mainstream and people want to get involved. These are done in no particular order, but they will all add value to your financial wellness. So, Steve, what makes up the top five? Okay, let's do it. Um, Number one, the the largest expenditure you will have in your lifetime is going to be on your retirement. So taking care of your retirement early and starting to take advantage of um, some of the systems and the products that are out there, uh, I think you should start talking about retirement. Most companies will have a 401k, and in that 401k, they'll match your contribution. This is free money. Repeat, free money. So you should be taking the free money as much as you can and start there. Because that's a great way if you put in 2 or 3% and you matched with 2 or 3%, you're immediately at 5% savings, and it really hasn't impacted you as much as you think. Number two, invest in your education and knowledge. Learning is a lifetime endeavor, and it will add considerably to your overall wealth. The number one item the Fed noticed in terms of improving people's life was a degree. So that degree will add somewhere between $500,000 and $700,000 over the course of your life. Education matters. The more you learn, the more you earn. Number three, you are the biggest asset, your human capital. So take care of your body, your mind, and your spirit. Number four, compounding is a great force, and you should use it to improve your chance of success. And number five, asset types and expenses need to be understood to benefit you. Just as you learn how to cook, you learn how to do things with your uh, yard and with your home, you you need to do the same with your assets in terms of financial assets. These are high-level ideas, and you can apply them in a rigorous or casual way. The important thing is to start thinking about them, start taking action one day at a time. So, Steve, let's focus on the retirement aspect. Why bother with retirement in your 20s? I mean, isn't there plenty of time when you're still 23, 24, 25? Um, Your career will take you many places. And you need to get started and get your match 
and get confidence that you're acting for your financial future. The minute you start to talk about doing something, it immediately, if you implement it, you immediately get some feedback that says, hey, look at this. Every month I'm doing this. Every year I've done this. And that momentum needs to start early. And if it does start early, you can handle this retirement. But right now, one of the worst parts of our um, financial literacy as a country is that people aren't prepared for retirement. Okay, so retirement is, in my view, obviously a critical factor. Uh, I also agree with you on education and school. Those are critical factors as well. Um, in fact, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, Steve, you and I both uh, went out there and got the uh, designation of chartered financial analyst. I think uh, that's uh, helped us measurably uh, in our careers. Uh, but, you know, in general, you know, you know how, speak to the issue of education uh, and um, and school. You know, how does that really help, uh, you know, especially on a lifeline, lifetime basis? So I think there's a concept here that was really, you know, talked about and discovered and recognized in the 70s. There was an, an economist at Chicago named Gary Butler who won the Nobel Prize for the idea of human capital. It used to be people thought of capital only as equipment and factories, real estate, physical items. And then his idea was looking at the GDP per person, he noticed that the countries with higher education levels had higher GDP per person. And so if you think about effectiveness at a country level, you, you would want to have more GDP so there'd be more resources so you could afford more schools, roads, et cetera. So his concept really started at the country level. And when you think about it, you're going to have 40 years of your career and 20 to 30 years of retirement. So when you look at your human capital, whatever you're preparing it for, you're you're going to put yourself in a better position the more opportunities and the more strengths you have on your resume. So when I look at the concept of GDP per person, it eventually led to the concept of human capital and starters of um, startup companies and investment managers who were yielding great results and getting pay, pay, helping pay their uh, their clients for their fees. So it used to be the expression when I was at State Street that all the talent goes up and down in the elevators every day. That's the human capital that matters. And so now I think we're taking this human capital to the next level. We're not thinking about big companies. We're not thinking about how much human capital Musk brings to Tesla. We're thinking about how do individuals think about themselves? When I was graduating from college, all I had was debt. I had no assets. I was starting life, and but my human capital, because I had graduated from engineering school and math degree, that human capital in me had potential for 40 plus years to generate reasonable income and ultimately allow me to save. That's when you're at your richest with human capital, but at your poorest with financial assets. As you add to those financial assets and they start to grow, you start to realize that your human capital is being transferred to financial assets. And that's really the concept that people need to understand. When they're doing something, they're doing something that they take with them. When I got my CFA, I was with State Street, and I took that with me to other companies because it's an asset in me. I'm now worth more because I got a CFA. And that's the way people need to think of it. Enhance your value, make yourself more valuable, and ultimately, those certifications and conference can help you find a niche or a specialty. You have a special set of skills and abilities. When you bring those to the companies, they want to include you in the organization, the more things you can bring. So what do you think of these guidelines, Clem? Uh, I think they're excellent, and I would add a few observations. Uh, first of all, you know, when I look at a younger generation, and actually not that much younger, 
uh, than uh, we are, Steve. I, you know, folks tend to spend far less time at a particular company than, say, uh, we did, Steve. And, you know, there's a lot, I wouldn't say job hopping, that used to be the, the negative connotation, but there's a lot of movement, you know, from one company to the next. And quite frankly, companies are, uh, some companies are less loyal to their employees uh, than perhaps they should be. And so there are layoffs uh, that, uh, that can happen quite frequently, especially in some industries. So you have to be prepared uh, to change, you know, to change jobs uh, if there are layoffs, uh, to change jobs uh, if you find potentially, you know, other opportunities, uh, to change jobs to develop additional skills uh, that you might get, you know, out of a new job, you know, using your old skills, applying your old skills, but picking up new skills. You have to be ready for that. And the way to be ready for that is to develop your education, uh, obtain certificates, build experience, move around different firms. This is, this, is, this is it. This is the way you build that human capital that you, Steve, were talking about uh, that can uh, be transferred into, uh, into financial assets uh, over time, uh, not just for your retirement, uh, but also so that you can have an enjoyable life uh, you know, throughout your life. Yeah, I mean, I think about all the travel you've done as being involved in international finance, and that's in line with what your values are. You're interested in international, so you travel more, and it it makes your, you know, speaking on the topic much deeper to have that. Um, I think that, you know, I'll start with number three. Um, you are the biggest asset. Your house, your car, your jewelry, your TV. Those aren't it. Um, you are the biggest asset, and therefore, you need to take care of that asset. You need to take care of your body, your mind, and your spirit in order to be the best you can be. I think that you know there's two ways you can find your life going, in a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle. Or it can just be moving sideways, but I'll take the two extremes. A virtuous cycle is you take care of yourself. You exercise, your diet is good, you meditate daily or pray. And all of a sudden, you're, when you go to work, you notice you have more energy, you seem to be more on top of things, and your boss appreciates that. And that leads to more um, income and more opportunities and more areas for you to succeed. If you don't bring that energy, if you don't take care of yourself, if you miss work and you have high health care costs, that's what we call a vicious cycle where you're not going to be succeeding and you're going to be having trouble at work, getting there on time and getting there to perform the same way that person who's exercising and, and has a, a, some good habits. And all of a sudden, your reviews aren't going to be as good. Your energy isn't as good. And therefore, your company starts to consider you when they're thinking about layoffs. That's the way you've got to look at yourself and say, in order for me to help this company, I need to first you know, as they say on the airplane, put your mask on first before trying to put help others with their mask, right? And that's where I think we all have to say, am I being selfish to go to the gym? Am I being selfish to do this, you know, fancier food that's organic and that not really. You're really trying to figure out the best way to be the best you. And so diet, exercise, meditation, rest, balance. All of these things help you to be better. There's free ways to find contentment. Forest bathing and other strategies out there. There was a study done in Toronto where they looked at people who walked in the underground tunnels that they have for during the winter. And they also had a person walk outside on the same two miles through the city outside, through the city underground. And the endorphins and the, and the information they got from the person who was outside was much more positive. Blood pressure was lower and the people were better. How does that happen? Because we benefit from being around nature. We benefit from these things. So therefore, align your plan, your vacations, your home, your bike versus a car, your talking and walking, 
all of these things help you take responsibility to making your life the best it can be. And ultimately, that improves your financial well-being. Wow, I like those uh, thoughts. So now how about, uh, how about your uh, thought number four, which is compounding? Sure, compounding is a mathematical term. And basically what it means is your earnings start to grow as well. So when you buy a company and it pays you a two or 3% dividend, that dividend then gets reinvested in more stocks. And now all of a sudden you have $103 instead of just $100 when you started at the beginning of the year. And leaving that alone and letting it compound really makes a difference. Time is your friend at 22. You have 40 years to retirement. Patience determines results. When we think about what characteristic of an investor makes him most successful, it's most likely patience. It isn't the um, timing of the market, it's the time in the market. So let yourself be patient and you'll realize that, hey, I'm doing things, my money is working for me, and therefore I don't need to be involved in touching it. Touching and changing and trading involves more taxes and transaction costs, which ultimately leads you to less good results. Over the 10 year rolling periods, there's almost no negative returns in the last 100 years. No negative returns if you leave something alone for 10 years. That's a pretty strong argument. Einstein had a comment, which is either accurately or not accurately attributed to him, that the miracle of investing is compounding. It's better to earn interest than to pay it. And I think that's a very good point for all of us is that we, we fund things that we wanna fund, but we, we try to avoid paying interest and we try to make sure that we're earning enough interest. Um, when you look at yourself and the compounding, I think of compounding, I think this should be um, invested in several ways. What do you invest in when you were young, Clem? How do you make sure that compounding helped you as you went along in life? So, you know, obviously I'm at an age where I, and with knowledge and skills right now, where I can make decisions about investing in particular stocks or, and other assets and avoiding other stocks and other assets. I can make those decisions. But when I was 23, 24, 25, I would say even when I was in my, uh, my early 30s, uh, I just felt like I didn't have enough knowledge uh, to be able to make those kinds of discriminating decisions. So I, I think when you're young, uh, the best thing to do to compound is to be in the market overall, uh, to, have an, to be in an index fund, you know, an S and P 500 index fund, uh, you know, maybe a combination of an S and P and a small cap and an international, uh, index funds. That's what I would do. That's what I did. Uh, and through a good chunk of my, um, you know, my youth, uh, I would spend, uh, investing in those, uh, broad passive market instruments and not, uh, certainly not speculate, nothing speculative. I mean, if, you know, if I started at State Street Global and they were the index kings. So, of course, the 401k had indexes. And so it was pretty easy to make the decision um, because I don't know if there wasn't even active a choice. And I think that some people are starting to lean that way with encouraging plans where the individuals are giving good choices and they're not giving choices that, you know, have one and a half percent fees and therefore are gonna you know, hurt their ability to, to compound well. Um, I think the most important thing is getting started and, and, and seeing the money grow. I think it has a, a, a great follow on effect. So for number five, um, asset types and fees. There's really two types of assets when we look at it simply. There's risky assets and there's safe assets. And I'll put risky assets as equities, homes, or real estate, commodities, um, other items. 
And then I'll say safe assets as bonds, cash, and items where you are going to get return of your principal, not just return on your principal. So um, Vanguard has done a study, not coincidentally, that shows that the best indicator of success for a fund is the fee. If the fee is low, the fund will have a higher probability of success in reaching its goal. If the fee is high, it has less of a success. And so let's just think about that. $10,000 invested with um, you know, 1% fee, you're losing two fees, $100 every year, right? So when you think about that, okay, $100, the 8% return that's the average is $800. So if you lose 100 of that 800, you're losing about 12.5% on your investment. That's significant. You're, I, I, I agree with the idea of you have to pay the manager something, but today we're paying managers and those, and those funds somewhere around $5. So when you think about that, $5 versus $100, $5 on um, you know, $800 is less than 1%. That's a big difference in 12 and a half. So when we think of an industry that's full of solutions, how do I break all these solutions down? First place you look is fees. Look at the fees and understand what you're paying for and when I looked at some of the fees in some of my, you know, um, IRAs, I was like, is this really going to give me that much more value that I'm going to pay a fee of 1% or 1.5%? And I hate to say this, but I see a lot of people who don't even know what their manager fees are. Look at your fees. Understand what you're paying and who you're paying it for. When I see people who have relationships with large brokerage organizations and that are non-fiduciaries, I see them say, oh, I'm paying this manager 1%. And then he's putting in me in five or six different mutual funds. Each of those funds have a 1% fee. Some of them have loads, which are 4 or 5% to get in. Now, all of a sudden, you're starting to see that these people are not really um, getting a lot for their money. That's what you got to avoid. So Buffett had a simple solution. He said, if I was to recommend to somebody and I wasn't here to invest for them, what would I get them? They should have 80% in an S&P index and 20% in treasuries. I um, think that's a simple and great explanation for how you should be invested. Should, should we try to be more sophisticated? Add international, add small, add mid cap, you know, I have a group of investments called the messy middle that are somewhere between being fixed income and safe and somewhere between being an equity and risky. I'd call those, you know, REITs, high yield, preferreds. They don't fully have the characteristics of all the safe assets and they don't have all the characteristics of the risky assets. So I'm a middle child, so I believe in the messy middle, but <laughs> I can see some people not. Time, again, is your friend. So therefore, make a decision, stick with it, and forget about it. Focus on your job, focus on your living, and let your investments work for you. That's what's most important. Time can yield more results, but there's no free lunches. Every time you take risk, you're most likely going to have to take, uh, to get great reward, you need to take greater risks. And I do recommend it when you're starting you have the more time to make up for some of those risks. So Steve, let's, uh, let's jump, shall we, to summarizing uh, the uh, podcast today. So what are your, again, what are your five big points, your five big takeaways uh, that you would uh, let, especially the younger people know about how to approach investing? Okay, the first one is retirement. Focus on it early get started. It's a big mountain to climb, but you, you got to start sometime. And the sooner you start, the more you're going to be able to tackle it. Number two, invest in your education and your knowledge. You are um, 
going to add more and have less unemployment when you have an education. Three, you are the biggest asset, not the home, not the car. So take care of your body, mind, and spirit. Three, compounding is a great force and you should use it to improve your chance of success. It is one tool and one idea. So therefore, put it in the mix and say to yourself, I'm not touching these assets because if I touch them and I cheat and I take money out, I'm hurting my long-term capability and my long-term results. And five, asset types and expenses need to be understood to benefit you. I think that all of these items are doable and all of the items just take a little bit of time and you'll get a great return on that time you spent. Clem, do you have anything else to add? I do not. Steve, I think you covered everything extremely well. I hope our audience, especially the younger folks in our audience, uh, got a lot out of this experience. Please let us know if you have any questions or would like us to follow up in any of these areas. Uh, we really uh, would uh, welcome the opportunity to talk about you know, some of this uh, material in greater depth. So Go thank you it, very much. Go ahead, Steve. The views shared on this podcast represent the personal investment views of the hosts. They are for educational purposes and not meant to be taken as investment advice. Listeners should consult their own investment, legal, and tax advisors. Past performance of any investments is not a guarantee for future return.